coming up. After every show, there always be these Sicilian mobsters come back and have their picture taken with Sinatra. By 1961, Frank Sinatra and his Rat Pack pals were on a roll. They were treated like royalty in Vegas and in Hollywood. Since, of course, they'd taken some of the credit for electing a president, they expected the same treatment in Washington. But no matter how hot you are, eventually the dice come up snake eyes. The Rat Pack did their part to get John F. Kennedy elected by hosting benefits and campaigning for the young senator. But some critics suggested that Frank Sinatra's connections to organized crime helped the cause. In true Rat Pack fashion, the rumors became a running gag. And he did four songs, and he started to do his fifth song, and he cleared his throat. As he, and I walked out, that's enough singing, Frank. And say, they know you can sing. Why don't you tell them about some of the good work the mafia is doing now? <laughs> I never heard anybody laugh that hard, I swear to you, in my life. I know that he worked very hard for, for Kennedy, and actually Frank claims to have gotten him elected, which may well be true, because he did get uh, a certain group of Chicago people and so forth um, to support Kennedy, and he worked very, very hard at it. For most Vegas performers of the day, the Mafia was a constant presence, and not necessarily a negative one. Performers never really had any problems with them. I mean, they were the great payers in the world. I mean, they paid you right on time, and they even gave you bonuses. Frank, uh, you have to realize, is the most popular tie-in since Christopher Columbus. After every show, there will always be these Sicilian mobsters come back and have their picture taken with Sinatra. The, the mobs uh, had their own set of laws and rules, and that's what Frank wanted. He had his own set of rules. You did it his way. And he could admire them all because they didn't have to worry about the laws of the land or, or what anybody else thought. Frank's only misgiving about his association with the mob that spanned about 45 years of his life was the fact that people wanted to write about it and wanted to care about it. And he didn't want us to write about it or care about it. He just wanted to be able to do it. Frank got his wish for a while. As Kennedy took office and rumors continued to swirl, it was business as usual for the Rat Pack. In early 1961, Sinatra re-teamed with Dean, Sammy, Peter, and Joey for a new film, a comic western entitled Sergeants 3. As always, Frank ran the show at the remote Utah location. Co-star, Ruta Lee. While he liked having his friends around him to do movies, they were also big box office. So he, he knew what he was doing. While having a good time, we can also make a few bucks. Actress Jeannie Carmen. He had everything ready and he didn't want to fool around. He didn't want anybody else to be having other takes. He didn't want, he wanted his one take and that was it. You rehearse it from here to kingdom come, but don't call me and when we come in to do the shot, tell me, oh, we have to fix that. Oh, that went out over there. Oh, the board creaked there. Get it perfect. We'll come in, we'll give you one take and that's it. Frank was very cocky and arrogant uh, when he was on a set or anywhere else as far as I was concerned. Sergeants 3 was released on February 10th, 1962 to mixed reviews. I think one reviewer said it was a four million dollar home movie. It wasn't that terrible a film. It was the, the Rat Pack being themselves and having a good time. Without the hip cachet that accompanied Ocean's Eleven, Sergeants 3 barely registered at the box office. The public was more interested in Frank Sinatra's association with Chicago mob boss Sam Giancana. Giancana's nephew, author Sam Giancana. Someone like Frank Sinatra, who was, you know, uh, among the most famous uh, entertainers of, of his time, could draw a big crowd. And uh, if uh, you can get that crowd at an establishment owned by Sam Giancana, that meant a lot of money for the mob. The heat generated by Sinatra's links to the Chicago crime outfit tainted his other relationships, including his close ties to the White House. With Frank Sinatra's huge media attention and the Hollywood glitz that he could put uh, forth to the Kennedy uh, uh, campaign, that provided a you know, nationwide focus. Sam Giancana, on the other hand, was in a position to help mobilize his people to get the vote out. 
The controversy boiled over in January 1962. Frank's Rat Pack connection to the president, Peter Lawford, arranged for JFK to stay at Sinatra's Palm Springs estate during a trip to California. Frank, uh, his house down Rancho Mirage, uh, he wanted to make it the winter White House. And um, he had helicopters fly in lumber so he could build homes for the Secret Service and everything else. And uh, all of a sudden, JFK wasn't going to stay at Frank's house. Robert Blakely served in the Justice Department during the Kennedy administration. It's an embarrassment to our organized crime work to have the President of the United States spending time with, with Frank Sinatra, where people we're investigating are friends of Frank Sinatra. And Robert Kennedy's comment was, if that's true, prepare me a re report. Robert Kennedy took it to the President, and the President had nothing else to do with Frank Sinatra. Sinatra was furious and took his anger out on the nearest target. He never spoke to Peter Lawford after that. Peter Lawford was only the messenger. Frank Sinatra was the king of Vegas and wielded his power freely. One wrong move and you could find yourself out of favor and out of work. Coming up... That was it. supposed to be the reunion, Rat Pack reunion. And Dean couldn't quite continue with the lifestyle. And later... Frank Sinatra to me is not a name, it's an institution. You know, the Rat Pack was a very talented group of guys. For a while it seemed like they could do anything they wanted, whether they wanted to do movies, albums, stage shows, parties. No, well, particularly parties. But the Rat Pack parties led to one long hangover. The decades after the glory days were marred by bitterness, squabbling, and tragedy. After Sinatra was snubbed by the Kennedys, Frank ousted Peter Lawford from the inner circle. But that wasn't the end of the pack. In 1963, Frank and Dean Martin began filming Four for Texas. Four for Texas was a sort of nominal Rat Pack movie in that it only featured uh, Frank and Dean and none of the others. Later that year, Sammy Davis Jr. joined Frank and Dean for the production of Robin and the Seven Hoods. The film also featured Bing Crosby in a role originally intended for Lawford. While shooting a graveyard scene on the morning of November 22, 1963, the cast and crew received word that President Kennedy had been assassinated in Dallas. Despite JFK's rejection of Sinatra, Frank was hit hard by the tragedy. Frank was really devastated by that. And even then, he didn't speak to Peter Lawford. He called up uh, everyone else in the Kennedy family, ignored Lawford. After a few weeks, they went back to filming, and uh, they made the picture. Neither film garnered much attention, and the Rat Pack's prominence was soon eclipsed by four mop tops from Liverpool. When the Beatles came along, Beatlemania and the British Invasion, uh, the younger people in the United States saw Frank and Dean as being their you know, old folks, uh, passe, their parents' uh, idols. To many observers, there was a changing of the guard, and the Rat Pack and their swinging lifestyle was on the way out. Sinatra, as stubborn and mercurial as ever, soldiered on. He was Frank, he was himself at all times, and nothing would influence him. Uh, he would sacrifice opportunities that he had to be what he was and to act like he acted and do what he wanted to do. As Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra continued with their solo careers, Sammy Davis Jr. teamed with Peter Lawford in 1967 for a film entitled Salt and Pepper. While shooting the movie in swinging London, the two men indulged in some illegal substances, which annoyed Frank to no end. Davis and Lawford were heavy into the drug scene, and Sinatra didn't mind getting sloshed on alcohol, but if you did drugs, forget it. He just hated them. It was, reminded him too much of youth and long hair and the Beatles. So you were on the outs with him if you did drugs. And uh, there really wasn't a Rat Pack at that time. Throughout the 60s and 70s, the members of the Rat Pack struggled to remain vital and to outlive their own legend. Sammy Davis Jr., the consummate party animal, battled substance abuse and health problems. He drank so much and did drugs at a certain point, etc., because he was always under pressure. Uh, 
Am I going to be broke and be Mr. Bojangles? Uh, am I going to be rejected here or here or here? Peter Lawford became one of the most tragic figures from the Rat Pack era. After Frank Sinatra cut him out of his life, he found that film assignments were few and far between because Frank was still a force to be reckoned with in Hollywood and you didn't go against Sinatra, so producers were afraid of hiring him. Finally, on December 24, 1984, Peter Lawford passed away due to liver failure. He was 61 years old. Tragedy also struck Dean Martin. In March 1987, the perennially cool and unflappable crooner lost his son, Dean Paul Martin, in a plane crash. Already an intensely private person, Dean became even more isolated. In a last-ditch attempt to revive the Rat Pack, Frank Sinatra proposed a series of reunion concerts with Dean and Sammy. Dubbed the Together Again Tour, the trio went out on the road in March 1988. That was it. It was supposed to be the reunion, Rat Pack reunion, and Dean couldn't quite continue with the lifestyle. Frank was for partying all night long. Dean wanted no part of that, and Frank got disgusted with it. And so they did a show in Chicago, and they went to a party, and in the middle of the night, uh, Dean called up and <laughs> took Frank's plane and came home. He wasn't going to go out and be this wobbly old man with a voice cracking, you know. He was going to quit when he was ahead. Liza Minnelli was brought in as Dean's replacement, and Frank and Sammy finished the tour. The concerts marked some of the last public appearances for Sammy Davis, Jr., the performer succumbed to throat cancer on May 16, 1990. When Sammy died, there was a, an historic occurrence in Las Vegas. It was the first time in Vegas history, Las Vegas, that they dimmed the lights for about 10 minutes, and it had never happened before. Or since, a new Vegas has sprung up on the very foundation of the old. The hard-drinking, hard-living Rat Pack might be surprised to see some of the wholesome family entertainment, like my friend Siegfried and Roy. And like the Rat Pack, these guys put on a great show. Coming up... He died on Christmas morning. I said, can you think of a nicer gift for heaven? By the dawn of the 1990s, two original members of the Rat Pack, Peter Lawford and Sammy Davis Jr., had passed away. As Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin wound down their careers, the town they helped put on the map was undergoing a major facelift. Heartbroken over his son's tragic death, Dean Martin gave up performing in the early 90s. Dean, in his later years, went over to Italian restaurant every night, always dining alone, and the same routine every night bottle of Italian red wine and pasta. And I would see him occasionally, but not very often. And he was not that sexy, bouncy, all-wise kind of wonderful gentleman. He was becoming a very quiet, a somber, older gentleman now. The twinkle was gone. Once the heart and soul of the Rat Pack Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin rarely spoke near the end of their lives. Dean wanted to make friends with them. Frank, you know, he's a hot-headed guy and, and kind of a stubborn guy, and there was no making friends. Dean Martin died of acute respiratory failure in December 1995. He died on Christmas morning. I said, can you think of a nicer gift for heaven? Dean used to go to a restaurant every night, an Italian restaurant in Beverly Hills, every night by himself, sit in the booth. And after he died, then Sinatra came in just to look at the booth that Dean was in. That's the way it was with those two. Somebody said to me one time, Joey, there's only you and Frank left. I said, Shh, be quiet. Frank's got connections. Frank had connections, but he couldn't stop progress. In November 1996, the 80 year old singer watched with the rest of the world as the Sands Hotel, once the epicenter of the Rat Pack's realm, was demolished. Former Sands chorus girl, Jean Gardner. It was sad to see him tear it down. It was just, it was almost like a monument because we had had so many great, wonderful entertainers there and so many good times. And it was an era that I really don't believe we'll ever see again in Las Vegas. 
I mean, who could replace the Rat Pack? I mean, the charisma and the magic that these people had was incredible. Sands was the lady of the strip, you know, the queen of the strip, and they blew it up. Oh, can't believe it. I still can't believe it. And they're still blowing them up. When these hotels get older, they have to blow them down and they have to rebuild in order to keep up with the competition. So that's happening a great deal. It's like a war zone out there. They're blowing them up right and left. The end of an era was marked on May 14, 1998, when Frank Sinatra died of a heart attack at the age of 82. Frank Sinatra to me is not a name, it's an institution. He's part of Americana and a certain culture that he's introduced. He was a unique human being. Uh, he had his own set of rules and he lived by them. I was a pallbearer on that day that we said arrivederci to our dear friend Frank in 1998. Entertainment in Las Vegas would never be the same. These days it seems like I'm the last of a breed here in Vegas, but I'm not planning on going anywhere anytime soon, so you can find me 40 weeks a year doing what I love doing right here at the Stardust. Coming up... Now it's controlled by corporations. Believe me, it was much more fun when the mob controlled it. In the decades since the Rad Pack reigned at the Sands Hotel, Las Vegas has transformed itself from a resort town to a giant theme park, where casinos and lounges once catered to adults, massive hotels and flashy stage shows now draw crowds of all ages. For those who witnessed the Rat Pack up close, today's Las Vegas stands in stark contrast to the city that Frank and the boys treated like a playground celebrity personal investigator Don Crutchfield. It was controlled by the mob. Uh, they had front men in all the casinos, running the casinos. Now it's controlled by corporations. Believe me, it was much more fun when the mob controlled it because uh, they gave you rooms, they gave you entertainment, they gave you food. They, they just knew they were going to make it on the gambling and they didn't have to cheat you. Every hotel built in Las Vegas, the days when I was there, had a lot of glamour. And the people that attended hotel also had glamour. When the Rat Pack was in Las Vegas, it was really Sin City back then. It was a wild, sexy town. Gambling was still considered sinful back then. Nowadays, it's, you know, whole families go and take their kids to the latest theme casino. New York, New York has the roller coaster ride outside their hotel. Well, now, if Bugsy Siegel were alive today and he saw something like that, I don't know whether he would approve it approve of it. I really don't know. Well, you got a tiger running across the stage and an elephant in the back trying to get on the stage too. That'll cost you 90 bucks. I used to go to a circus only cost me three dollars. <laughs> While big hotels like New York, New York, the Bellagio, and the Venetian offer family entertainment, adult shows can still be found. Topless reviews like Skin Tight at Harrah's and La Femme at the MGM Grand cater to a more mature crowd. Veteran performers may bemoan the loss of the old Vegas, but there's a new breed who remain committed to the Rat Pack style. Impressionist Danny Gans. I went and saw Sammy Davis Jr. And the man sang, he danced, he acted, he did impressions, he did the instruments. I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a modern day version of a Sammy Davis. And that's what the show is all about now. For the members of Blue Man Group, the Rat Pack casts a long shadow. They've given life to this town. This town's giving life to other forms of art. Yeah, they, they, paved, it, they paved the pathway for us to come, and now we're paving the pathway for even yeah, we, more. Yeah, we, we almost should pay thanks to, to them totally. that we have jobs here. Vegas looks different, but demolishing a few casinos has not dampened the Rat Pack mystique. The swinger culture embodied by Frank, Dean, and Sammy experienced a rebirth in the late 90s. Dean Martin's grandson, Alexander Martin. For some reason, my, my generation has embraced the sort of chic cool and, and swagger of it. It's, it's bizarre now that people who I went to high school with or people that I, my friends who three years ago had no idea who Sinatra was and, and my grandfather was, suddenly now are donning, you know, the suits and, and the fedoras. The Rat Pack legend has come full circle. 41 years after the infamous Summit at the Sands, an all-star cast assembled to shoot a remake of Ocean's Eleven. George Clooney, Julia Roberts, and Brad Pitt 
joined a host of other big name stars for the production in Las Vegas. You know, with Rat Pack revivals and Rat Pack impersonators, the history they created still echoes through Las Vegas. But it'll be tough for any gang of entertainers to duplicate the Rat Pack's passion for fun. Back then, fun was guilt-free, and the Rat Pack showed the world how to throw a party. I'm Wayne Newton, and we'll see you all in Las Vegas.